Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to be going over how to identify metamorphic rocks in both hand sample and thin section. So first I want to start with what I consider the more simple or easy metamorphic rocks like marble and quartzite, which pretty much only have one major component. And first we'll start with marble. So marble is the metamorphic equivalent of limestone or dolostone, and is mainly composed of just calcite or dolomite or both calcite and dolomite, because that's what limestone and dolostone are composed of. For that reason, we can see in these two hand samples here, it's just one color, it's just one texture, and it's because it's just one mineral. It's just mainly calcite. And sometimes marble can change and vary in its color slightly because of impurities, but in general, it's a white or off-white kind of color. And in the thin section, we pretty much see just that. We see one mineral, we see pure calcite and or dolomite. Calcite and dolomite do look similar under thin section, but what's really distinct about calcite under thin section is it's three cleavage planes. So you can see these lines here on each of these calcite grains in these thin sections. Those lines represent cleavage planes. There's two on this grain, as you can see. And if we were to rotate that thin section under the microscope, you'd see those lines change and appear differently as we rotate it differently because those grains are changing ever so slightly in angle as you rotate the thin section relative to the angle that the light is hitting them. And you can see there are other cleavage planes, but this is how we can recognize calcite under thin section. It's just these very light pale colors that have these pale interference colors show up as you rotate the thin section under cross polarized light. And I will be showing you guys later in the video some live rotations of thin sections under the microscope so you can see how the interference colors of the minerals change as you rotate them and how the twinning and cleavage looks as you rotate it. But I'm going to be showing you those with some other rocks that I actually found the resources available online to show you guys that. So I didn't have an example for marble, but I figure it's a relatively simple one. And before we move on to quartzite, I do want to mention that the texture, this kind of um, intergrowth crystalline texture of these marble samples and thin section is called decussate texture. And we'll see later as we get into the other rocks with different textures that they're often polygonal or they have more like polygonal context than more intergrowth context like these do. And so we'll, I'll mention that when we get to that. Now moving on to quartzite. Basically quartzite is the metamorphic equivalent of quartz rich sandstone. And over here to the right, we can see some hand sample examples with basically just pure quartz. Um, they are orange because they have impurities in them, but it's mainly quartz. And then also the thin section is dominated by quartz, which is like the polka dotted black and white crystals that we see all throughout the thin section. Again, if we were to rotate the thin section, you'd see those kind of like shine white and then black again and go back and forth because that's called going into extinction. We talked about extinction and other optical mineralogy terminology in both the optical mineralogy videos. I'll link the first one up here to the top right in case you haven't seen it and want to know more about that kind of terminology. But the other major thing that we see in this thin section, or actually minor thing that we see in this thin section, other than quartz, is a little bit of muscovite here. And that's this pink platey stuff. We'll talk way more about muscovite as we get into the lecture because there's a lot of muscovite and schists and phyllites and things. Um, but we see a little bit of minor amounts of muscovite here. Muscovite alters from clay minerals. So maybe this sandstone had minor amounts of clay or money minerals in it um, that made it has a little bit of muscovite when it was metamorphosed. And I say here there are no porphyroblasts or poikiloblasts in this sample, and that's just because there's no clasts that stand out from the general size of grains in this matrix of quartz here. And I'll define porphyroblasts and poikiloblasts way more clearly as we see some more examples of these types of blasts in the other rock types. But before we move on from quartzite and marble, I do want to mention that superficially, if you have a hand sample of marble and a hand sample of quartzite, they may look similar. And sometimes it's hard to distinguish between the two. However, the major thing that I would say is the easiest way to tell between the two if you don't have a thin section, because obviously under thin section, quartz and calcite look very different. Um, but if you don't have a thin section and you just have hand samples, you can test the hardness. We talk about hardness in one of my first mineralogy videos. I will link it up here to the top right for you. But basically, it's how hard the mineral 
general for rock is. It's really, you know, simple terminology there. And you can test how hard the mineral or rock is by scratching it with various things of different hardness levels. The major difference between quartzite and marble is that quartzite cannot be scratched by metal blade and marble can. Marble is softer than quartzite. And if you happen to have any dilute HCl around you, which if you're in a geology lab, I know you do, <laughs> you can also test whether it's marble or quartzite by seeing if you drop a little drop of HCl onto it. If it fizzes, then it's marble. If it doesn't fizz, it's likely quartzite. Now for some real-time examples where I'm going to rotate the thin section under the microscope with you guys so you can see how the minerals change under cross and plane polarized light. So here we have an example of quartzite where you can see the black and white flashing of the quartz in the cross polarized light on the right. Um, but these grains of quartz are much larger than the sample we were just looking at. So it looks like they're just like very large and they're taking up the whole frame. But you can see a little bit of the smaller circles down here. And if we rotate it, you can see them kind of speckle and flash. The other thing we notice about this sample is that it's got a little bit more of a preferred crystal orientation, meaning that it probably underwent higher pressures to be kind of flatten those mineral grains um, when it was being metamorphosed. The other quartzite sample I want to show here is not pure quartz, um, and I wanted to show it for that reason. It's also got smaller quartz grains, so you can see if we rotate this right image here that the quartz is very flashy, black and white. That's just like classic quartz under thin section, under cross polarized light, and you can see in the plain polarized light, you can hardly see anything at all for the quartz. That's because it doesn't have pleochroism, meaning it doesn't have colors or show colors under plain polarized light, whereas this other accessory mineral in this quartzite sample does, and it is this pinkish orange color under plain polarized light and this greenish bluish brownish color under cross polarized light, and this mineral is peomanite. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's what this accessory mineral is, and you can see it changing color as well under cross polarized light. Now back to the PowerPoint. Phyllite is the next metamorphic rock we will look at, and this is a fine grain foliated rock with crenulation. Crenulation is just the highly folded, wavy, foliated texture of phyllite. And this thin section, as shown here by these five images, is dominated by muscovite, biotite, quartz, and porphyroblasts of garnet. So basically, the muscovite in each thin section is the extremely foliated mineral that is rainbowish in color under cross-polarized light. And this is in all of the samples as labeled, even the one over here to the right. It's not labeled there, but everything that is kind of the shiny greenish blue tint over here, that is muscovite. And if you were to rotate the thin section, which I'll show in a second, you would see it shining all sorts of rainbowish interference colors in the plain polarized light as shown in the bottom picture. Muscovite isn't a bright color, but the colored micas that you can see in plain polarized light are typically biotite. Biotite is also this larger class over here on the side of this thin section. And then we've also got the garnet porphyroblast. Again, porphyroblast is just a larger grain in a finer ground mass. And in this case, the porphyroblasts are garnet. We can see one over here to the right as well. And lastly, we have some minor quartz also included in this thin section, as we can see very well in between the muscovite layers of the middle thin section picture. And the last thing I'll say about phyllite before we move on to schist is that sometimes people mix up schist and phyllite. And I had trouble with this for a long time before I saw more and more samples of phyllite and got used to seeing what it looked like. And to me, I think the biggest thing is that schist is a lot more shiny and a lot more flaky. Phyllite is so just compacted together that it's just not really at the flaky state. And these are kind of, you know, subjective things to look for, shininess and flakiness. But I do think that is helpful when, you know, you're in lab and trying to distinguish between the two. Phyllite is just, in my experience, more compacted and crenulated and and I've even heard some people describe phyllite as being like a zebra look because the folds or the crenulations kind of have light shining on them in a light way and a dark way in the dips and it makes it look zebra-y whereas I've never seen a schist like that. Schist is pretty much just all very flaky and shiny because of the mica minerals. Again, mica minerals, I don't know if I said this but I should have, include clay minerals like muscovite and biotite which have highly colorful interference colors under thin section and are very platy and shiny 
enhanced sample. So with that said, the next few samples will be schists. And this sample specifically is a garnet starlight schist. Well, we have the garnet starlight schist in the thin section pictures at top. And then on the bottom are hand samples of the one on the left is more of a garnet schist. And the one on the right is a starlight schist with some garnet in there as well, the little red dots. And so basically this type of schist contains quartz, as we can see in the more kind of black and white speckly parts of these thin sections. Muscovite, as we can see in the bright pink, greenish blue platy minerals in thin section. Starlight, as we can see by these huge elongated dark cross minerals in hand sample as well as in thin section. Starlight often shows these really distinct crosses under both thin section as well as hand sample as we can see here. Then we also have garnet, which we can see in both hand samples. In the left hand sample, the garnets are more large and euhedral, which just means they have well-defined crystal faces, whereas in the right sample, they are a little bit more tiny compared to the starlight, which is huge, and they're a little bit more altered, so I can't really tell unless I kind a thin section, whether they're euhedral or subhedral or anhedral. And in the thin section, they're just these big black clasts. And then also in the thin section, we can see biotite as well, which we saw on the previous slide in the phyllite, which is just this typically like brownish to tannish to greenish color, and also has like a golden brownish color in plain polarized light, but this is cross polarized light. And it's also platy, just like it's mica sister muscovite, but it just doesn't have as bright of interference colors as muscovite does. And then the last thing I want to say about the sample is that these garnet clasts are, instead of porphyroblasts, are poikiloblasts. And the reason is porphyroblasts do not have inclusions of other minerals in them, and poikiloblasts do have inclusions of other minerals in them. And we can see in all of these garnet clasts here that they do have inclusions of other minerals in them. And that often represents secondary metamorphism, meaning like it metamorphosed once and then it metamorphosed again, and it's just getting incredibly altered, and that's why poikiloblasts happen. Here we have two more samples of schist. The hand sample here is a garnet starlight schist. Again, kind of like the right image on the last slide, we've got little tiny garnets over here to the left. We've got larger garnets on the right. We've got starlight on the right. A little bit of tiny starlight on the left. The more elongated small dark greens are starlight on the left in the hand samples. And then over here to the right, we've got what we're calling a starlight schist schist, which is containing plagioclase, garnet, and starlight, porphyroblasts, and poikiloblasts in a matrix of muscovite and quartz bands with some biotite and hornblende. So that's a mouthful. Let's go through this step by step. Basically, we've got some starlight over here on the bottom of the left, which is also, I think, what this class over here is. I put a question mark just because it is black in that image, and I think that's because it's just starlight in extinction, and if I were to rotate it, it would again turn to this gold color on a cross polar light because I just think that class is too elongated to be a garnet. I do think this class that is a poikiloblast, if I've ever seen one in this thin section image here, is plagioclase. You can tell by all these lines, the twinning habit of plagioclase feldspar is just very indicative of feldspars. The class over here in this thin section image, I think is a garnet that is just very, very altered. And these secondary muscovite and quartz bands came in, uh, in a secondary or even tertiary metamorphosis event and uh, kind of just made this garnet class really just altered and poikiloblastic. But again, it's hard to tell what the class is underneath it um, when it is so altered. So I'm guessing it's garnet. If we were to rotate the thin section and it were to stay black, then I would know it's garnet because garnet does not have an interference color under cross polarized light. It remains black or in extinction the entire time you're rotating it because it's what's called isotropic. And I talk about isotropic versus anisotropic minerals and extinction and everything in that optical mineralogy video. So again, check that out if you'd like to know more about what that means. But basically, garnet will stay black as we rotate it. I'll show you an example of this later uh, when we show the rotation images again. And then this last image up here has clear muscovite, this bright pink platy mineral uh, band here that's all muscovite or 
at least mica minerals of some sort. I think it's muscovite just because it's bright colors. Then we got the typical speckly black and white quartz mineral here. And now let's look at a real time rotation example. So this guys is a garnet schist. We can see a huge class of garnet in the middle. We know it's garnet because as we rotate it under cross polars, it stays black. However, there are things in the middle of it that are changing colors as we rotate it. It looks black and white. So I'm going to say those are inclusions of quartz within the garnet class. And that is why we know that it is a poikiloblast of garnet because it does have inclusions of other minerals within it. Then we can also see surrounding it the shiny bluish pinkish platy minerals of banded muscovite and biotite. The biotite and muscovite can be distinguished guys because if we look over here to the plain polars, we can see that there is this brownish goldish uh, platy mineral that is occurring along with the muscovite that is pretty much clear in a plain polarized light. And the brownish color is biotite. We know that because biotite is pleochroic, meaning that it has color under a plain polarized light. And we can see that it also changes color as we rotate it under plain polars, as well as under cross polars. It's instead of the bluish pinkish color under cross polars, it's more of this goldish uh, tannish color as well under cross polars. And it again changes as we rotate it. And it's also platy and occurs with muscovite, but the way that you can distinguish it is looking at the plain polarized light. And now that we've seen garnet starlight schist rotated and we're a little dizzy, let's get back to the PowerPoint. Now on to blue schist. Blue schist can be blue in color because of typically blue minerals, like for example, glaucophane. Glaucophane is a notably blue mineral in hand sample that can turn a schist blue in tint and it also is blue under plain polarized light as we can see in these thin section images here both of these you know platy blue uh, minerals here are glaucophane we can also see it in the cross polarized image here which is the same as this image up here this is just in cross polars and it is kind of brighter interference colors but largely blue still under cross polars the brighter colors that are a little bit more blocky rather than platy and habit are epidote crystals i believe i mean this is again how I'm interpreting this in section, uh, but that's what I think is going on here. And so let's take a look at some real time rotation examples again. So here is what this website is calling a glaucophane schist. Now, originally, I really wasn't sure what this class in the center of all the glaucophane was. Uh, but as I rotate it under cross polarized light, it is staying in extinction. And for that reason, I think that it is garnet. It's just kind of an odd shape to be garnet from what I've seen, but it's probably just very altered. And regarding the glaucophane, I mean, guys, if you look at the plain polarized light, you already see all the blue pleochroism going on. And then if we look at the cross polarized light, it's also very colorful, just like what we saw in our thin section on the PowerPoint. And as we rotate it around, we see the grains going in and out of extinction with exception of the garnet class. So because this is so glaucophane rich, I would agree with their classification of it as a glaucophane schist, especially when you can see there is clear lineation or just a flattening of the crystals along a certain direction or what's called foliation. However, I would have to look at a larger uh, zoomed out thin section or even hand sample to maybe determine how often these garnet clasps show up. And if they show up pretty often, I might even go as far as to name it a glaucophane garnet schist or garnet glaucophane schist. Um, but it just depends on how often they show up. And you should also keep in mind that when you're thinking of what to call something, and if you have two prefix names to your larger rock name that you're going to add on, you should note, for example, if you have a garnet starlight schist, like we saw on one of the previous slides, then you should call it garnet starlight schist. If these starlights are more abundant than the garnet, because the name closest to the end rock name is should be the most abundant thing. And it, you could call it a starlight garnet schist if the garnet are more abundant and the starlights are more minor. This next example is amphibolite. Amphibolite is exactly what it sounds like, a metamorphic rock containing a lot of amphiboles. And in hand sample over here to the left, we can see it tends to look very dark black and kind of with lighter gray and white speckles in it, and sometimes even kind of black and white, um, depending on how much silica content or felsic material it has in it. And we can see this thin section specifically has a lot of horn blend in it, horn blend and other amphiboles, and sometimes peroxines also are known to have green pleochroic colors uh, in plain polarized light. And then under cross polars, they are just very colorful. Both um, amphiboles and peroxines can be pretty colorful 
purple and their interference colors under cross polarized light. So uh, when you see very colorful kind of blocky polygonal type of texture of metamorphic rock, then it's probably or likely an amphibolite. If not an amphibolite, it's just got a lot of peroxines and amphiboles in it. And this is typical of metamorphosed mafic igneous rocks like basalt, for example. So let me show you some real time examples of amphibolite. Here we have a sample that is a little bit more uh, flattened, indicating probably a higher pressure scenario of metamorphism. And we can also see that these have less bright interference colors than the sample we were just looking at in the PowerPoint. And that just probably means slightly different minerals that are in the amphibolite here. Um, but this isn't still an amphibolite. It's still, you know, brighter colors than like the black and white quartz or like you can tell it's not muscovite. You can also tell it's not like garnet. So it's pretty distinct either way. You can also tell by the plain polarized light. It does have that greenish tannish color to it. And it's a bit more blocky and larger than would be, for example, biotite, which is more of a brownish goldish. It's uh, platier and smaller um, platy grains and like banded typically. So it's just very distinct. It's easy to tell apart from other minerals that we've gone over. And then I've got another sample here of another kind of amphibole. These guys can vary quite widely. As you can see, this sample has a lot more quartz. Um, so because of the higher silica content of this sample compared to the last one we looked at, I would say that this one would probably have more white in hand sample. If you were looking again, if we go back to the PowerPoint, we can see this white and black amphibolite that seems to have a lot more silica and therefore probably quartz in it um, compared to the upper sample, which is just a lot darker, probably has less silica in it. I would say that that last sample we were looking at under the section probably looks more like the lower sample because it has more quartz in it. You can also have garnet clasts or porphyroblasts and poichloroblasts in your amphibolite. For example, here we have a garnet amphibolite, which just means that it's an amphibolite that contains, in this case, poichloroblasts of garnet. Um, this hand sample also has garnet, uh, but I don't know whether the hand sample has porphyroblasts or poichloroblasts. I'd have to really look into a thin section of it. And it also has a very granular amphibole rich ground mass, as does the thin section. And the thin section clearly underwent probably secondary metamorphism because we can see that the poichloroblasts are quite altered in both their crystal shape, except, well, this one kind of seems euhedral, but it's just it got a lot of inclusions in it. So I'm going to say that that's just quite altered. And uh, you can see that the uh, fine grain ground mass is just very amphibole and peroxine rich because of the pleochorism that we can see in the plain polarized light, as well as the bright interference colors and blocky structure that we see in the cross polarized light. Oh, whoops, I was supposed to label them. My bad. There's some labels for you. And now another example of a mica schist and a biotite schist. Just so you can see kind of the difference between what I would call a mica schist and a biotite schist, basically mica does contain muscovites and biotite, but I called this upper right sample a mica schist because it seemed to contain relatively relatively equal amounts of both biotite and muscovite, whereas the bottom right sample seemed to contain a lot more biotite than it did muscovite. So with whatever scientific authority I have, I decided, okay, I'm going to call that a mica schist and this a biotite schist, but that is obviously up to interpretation. You could just call it a schist if you want to be simple with it and you don't want to get too fancy and mess up, which I think is a great strategy. If you don't have to put a prefix in front of it, don't. I mean, you never know, especially with just one image of a thin section. You really just got to explore the rock. But for the general purposes of knowing what kind of rock it is, these are both schists. One has more biotite than the other. That's the gist of this slide. We also have quartz in both samples. You can see a lot more quartz within the matrix of biotite in the left sample here, um, but both contain quartz. There's also a little bit of plagioclase or some sort of feldspar in the right sample. And we know that because quartz does not have these lines, which you can see over here down below the word biotite. There's also another liney cleavagey, probably plagioclase laugh in there as well. And so you can look at these liney crystal grains 
and probably know that's a feldspar. Next we have eclogite. Eclogite in my memory is just has a lot of garnet <laughs> and uh, the eclogite sample we had in lab uh, was very green in color probably because of minerals like chlorite maybe um, and just had a lot of garnet and I don't know exactly the amount of variety that's present in eclogites but these are the eclogite samples I'm familiar with so let's go over these. Basically we've got one eclogite over here in this thin section that is dominated by euhedral garnet poikiloblasts and we know they're euhedral because they have well-defined crystal phases we know they're poikiloblasts because they have inclusions within them of other minerals then we've got this eclogite in the center here that is dominated by euhedral garnet porphyroblasts they are porphyroblasts not poikiloblasts because they do not contain mineral inclusions then we have eclogite down here to the bottom left that contains garnet poikiloblasts like the top right image and granular epitope but has less garnet so i wouldn't say dominated by um and it just contains garnet poikiloblasts and they're not euhedral anymore <laughs> they are definitely don't have as well-defined crystal phases some of them do but i would say sub to anhedral then they also have granular epidote so the epidote again is this colorful blocky stuff the quartz is the black and white speculate stuff and in hand sample you can see what it looks like over here basically eclogites form by high pressure low temperature metamorphism of basaltic protolith remember that protolith just means the parent rock or the original rock that became metamorphosed and we talk about the terminology of metamorphic petrology in the first metamorphic petrology video in this playlist i'll link it up here to the top right if you haven't seen it and uh this typically occurs this type of metamorphism that forms eclogites typically occurs at subduction zones and the abundance of garnets in eclogites suggests an aluminous basalt protolith so aluminum rich next we have nice there are three major types of nice that i will talk about on this slide granular nice strifen nice and augen nice Granular nice is exactly what it sounds like. It's just like granular. It doesn't seem to have any preferred orientation of mineral grain or banding, whereas the strifen nice does have strifen banding. Um, and Ajin nice has banding, but also clasts that are kind of stand out among the banding. And the banding kind of goes around them. Um, and we can see that better in thin section. I'll show a picture here. Basically, um, you can see the Ajins here are these clasts. There is a clast in this image in the plane polarized light as well as cross polars in the upper left of quartz and then we see some banding down here in the plane polars of likely biotite it's platy it's got pleochroism so we're gonna guess biotite and then we've got a feldspar ogen with quartz kind of surrounding the upper edge uh in this image over here and ogen nice as well as just all nices typically are formed under high grade regional metamorphism and their protolith is typically green now let's look at some real-time examples. So here's one example of NICE that I'm going to say is very zoomed in, so it's hard to tell, but I'm going to say it looks granular because I don't see any preferred grain orientation. So I'm not seeing any banding. I'm also not seeing any augens, but again, we would have to zoom out and look more throughout the thin section as well as the hand sample to really say that for sure. And we can see here that there is definitely quartz, um, the black and white speckly stuff, but then you've also got those lines going in there and you know that is feldspar so we've got feldspars i think they're plagioclases but guys plagioclase is so much easier for me to identify in igneous rocks because it still has this like elongated lath crystal habit whereas in metamorphic rocks it's obviously been a metamorphose so it's not got that lathy structure so i think it's plagioclase but i'm just calling like every feldspar i see plagioclase so who knows but it's not quartz that's all i know um i also see some biotite in here we can see the light brown here as well as the pleochroic biotite in the plain polarized light and then the other example of a nice i want to show you guys is this example here because it's a little different than that granular example we just saw uh, for example we see an ogen here the big black remaining in extinction class is garnet um, and uh, that is kind of cut off but we know it's garnet because it's just it's not you know showing any change from extinction in the cross polarized light and it's also a poiklo glass because there are inclusions and it's likely um an ogen nice because it does have that class we can also see it's dominated by quartz and then the bottom part well i guess there's no bottom but now it's at the bottom uh is uh, the biotite which obviously is the pleochroic stuff next i just really wanted to show this really poikiloblastic starlight mica schist as well as this extremely poikiloblastic garnet starlight schist 
Again, these are both schists. They're the same as what we've been looking at for the most part, but they are very poikiloblastic, indicative of you know being metamorphosed and then re-metamorphosed because they are just so altered. And I mean, you guys can see in these class here, they're just so much inclusions. It's almost taking up the entire class area and so we'll start over here to the right we see starlight this elongated goldish um lath here of starlight then we've got biotite we can see the pleochroism under plain polarized light uh, we've got quartz the speckly black and white stuff we've got garnet um over here to the bottom corner of the cross polarized light image i can tell because it's black um although i'm not rotating it i can tell just because of the crystal faces that it's probably a garnet um we've also got what i put question mark because i'm like muscovite um this is kind of a palady habit in a bright color so i'm thinking it might be a muscovite plate but it's very large and i don't tend to see muscovite that large especially in samples that has very fine green muscovite that i can see throughout in between the quartz greens here so i don't know if it's muscovite I, it looks like it it could be could be something else then if we move over here to the right we can see starlight in this class to the bottom and these pictures over here we also see quartz and muscovite banding and foliation in this thin section image and we've got some classes here that are very poikiloblastic so i'm not totally sure as to what they are so i kind of wrote garnet slash ampable poikiloblast because they're black which makes me think they might be garnet, but I'm not rotating them, so I'm not totally sure. And the other reason I said amphibole potentially is because the elongated rhombohedral shape that this is looks and reminds me of a lot of amphibole shapes. So I don't know for sure, but I have enough information from this sample to know that it's poikiloblastic, likely remetamorphosed, that it's schistose. It's got a lot of foliated muscovite and quartz banding that you know makes up a schist, at least as the matrix. And then there's a lot of clasts and poikiloblastic glow blasts in there as well that I would have to go in and really just further identify. But now moving on to serpentine or serpentinite. Serpentinite is a hydrothermally altered ultramafic metamorphic rock, which forms by hydrous alteration of olivine and many crustal peridotites or mantle rocks are extensively altered to serpentine, which is this mineral that serpentinite contains. We can see it in this thin section down here. Basically, it's this meshy texture that results from the replacement of olivine along the cracks of grain boundaries and it's just this very snakeskin like texture of a mineral in both thin section and hand sample almost it looks snaky so it's very recognizable it's very distinct um i don't think i really have to say anything more about it next we have an actinolite grain schist uh basically this is a semi-foliated metamorphic rock dominated by actinolite chlorite plagioclase feldspar muscovite minor clinoperoxine and quartz with a basalt protolith so it's a metamorphosed basalt and what we can see right off the bat is that it is you know semi foliated it's not very foliated it's kind of going every which way the elongated grains but it does have these elongated platy grains that have this greenish color i am not 100 sure whether the greenish tint is due to actinolite or chlorite um but you know what i called it an actinolite schist so we're gonna go with it <laughs> but um again that could be actinolite or chloride or both i'm not totally sure that's just what from my experience i think it looks like also if you look at this actinolite green schist thin section um this is what the internet called an actinolite green schist i'm not totally sure whether these are actinolite or muscovite greens but you know it could be both also here is a thin section image that i took from one of my samples that i took a picture of and i'm not quite sure whether this platy kind of brushy textured stuff is chlorite or actinolite i originally thought it was chlorite but i could be wrong i also don't know what the clasts are um it looks like we've got a porphyroblast here and a poikiloblast here i don't know whether it's muscovite or another mineral i put here potentially phlogopite because i was looking online and it looks like phlogopite has a similar interference color and habit under cross polarized light so that's what i think if you guys know comment down below help us all out that would be great um but now we're moving on to slate so slate is the metamorphic equivalent of a politic protolith which just means like a muddy or clayey protolith, uh, like shale, for example, but it is the low grade metamorphic equivalent of this type of rock, whereas the high grade metamorphic equivalent of shale would be uh, either a phyllite or a schist. And slate includes minerals like illite and mica. Again, mica minerals are things like muscovite and biotite, but in this mineral, we can see that it's mostly 
illite, which is again a clay mineral, um, but it's not you know fully altered to muscovite yet. And so the platy fine grainness of this mineral is dominated by illite and also some quartz. I see some more rounded, less platy uh, black and white speckles in here that I would call quartz. But again, I'd have to rotate the thin section and cross polars to see. And then we can see some lighter lathy minerals that I would say have interference colors that are indicative of muscovite. But again, they're minor compared to the illite in this slate mineral. And oh yeah, I already mentioned the quartz. <laughs> And then here we have an example of soapstone. Soapstone is a talc schist, a talc dominated uh, schist metamorphic rock that has a lot of talc in it. Talc is a very soft, hydrated manganese silicate mineral and soapstone often contains varying amounts of chloride and amphiboles as well. And it's formed by the metamorphism of ultramafic protolus, just like the serpentinite we saw on the previous slide. And a way that you can tell that soapstone is soapstone is basically Talc, the mineral that dominates soapstone, is really, really soft. It is not hard at all. And you can pretty much scratch it with your fingernail, I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure if soapstone, which is its metamorphic equivalent, would be that soft, but it's basically just really soft. So try and scratch it with any other rock you have in the lab or around you. And if you can scratch it with any other rock, then it's probably soapstone, or it probably contains a lot of talc because talc is just the softest thing. I think it is the softest mineral. Anyway, that is all for my classification practice metamorphic petrology video, guys. If you want to check out the reference for this video and other videos in my metamorphic petrology playlist, you can check out the reference below. It's called The Essentials of Igneous and Metamorphic Petrology by Ronald and Carol Frost. And the upcoming videos in this playlist include, we'll talk about the metamorphism of mantle rocks, as well as the metamorphism of politic or clay rocks. And if you guys have any suggestions for upcoming topics in this or any other playlist on my channel, please comment them down below. And the links for that website that I showed you with the rotating of the sin sections will be linked in my description below. And also I'll try to link some representative pictures of thin sections and stuff down below as well. But I took most of these thin section and hand sample pictures from uh, you know, when I was taking metamorphic petrology, and so I actually took these pictures with my phone facing down the microscope. You can do that if you don't know. You can like put your phone camera in the microphone, in the microphone, in the microscope lens, and uh, point it down. And if you're really steady with it, you can get a good picture of your thin section to study. That's what I did, and that's why I have all of these. So anyway, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll link as many resources as I can down below. And thanks again for watching. I will see you guys next time. Bye.